Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this annual general meeting of the Biotech Growth Trust. I sincerely hope that this is the last time we have to do this virtually. Uh, we did, as you remember, we had to do it last year and we have to do it this year. And in evidence of that, um, there are actually live in the meeting room, me, Andrew Joy, the chairman, and Julia Leblanc, who is chair of the audit committee, together with Mark uh, Pope from Prostro, a number of the other board members are actually self-isolating. Um, so I think it almost goes without saying that we have to do this one virtually. The time is now just after 12 noon. Uh, we're going to be begin today with a presentation from Orbibed, our por portfolio manager. There will be an opportunity uh, both after the presentation and then again after the formal business of the AGM uh, to ask questions. Um, if you have a question, please click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type the question in where indicated. Uh, when you do ask a question, it would be helpful if you could indicate the organization that you represent or if you are a private shareholder. Uh, thanks very much, um, and I'll now hand over to Jeff Shu from Orbimed. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this virtual presentation, and I'm happy now to give an update on the Biotech Growth Trust. So I thought I'd start off with just a high-level overview of our long-term track record. Orbimed became portfolio managers of this trust back in May of 2005, and you can see from this graph that the NAV per share of the trust has gone up over 13 fold since uh, our inception as managers. So we have beaten over this time period, the NASDAQ Biotech Index, the Benchmark Index shown here in gray, as well as the FTSE All Share Index shown here in purple. So over the past 16 years, biotech has certainly been a, a good place to invest. Let me give a quick update on the status of Orbimed, our investment firm. So as you know, we are a global healthcare dedicated investment firm. We have over 25 years of experience investing solely in this sector. Uh, we do have offices in New York, San Francisco, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mumbai, and Israel. And right now we have about $20 billion of assets under management. Our headcount now stands at 128 global employees. We did make over 20 new hires over the course of 2020 and year to date in 2021. And about 30 of my colleagues have either an MD or a PhD degree. Uh, so we have quite a bit of technical expertise in-house to make uh, investments in healthcare. Uh, the next slide just shows the specific team members that work on the Biotech Growth Trust. At the top of the slide is myself. I've been the portfolio manager of the Biotech Growth Trust continuously since 2005. And below me are a number of very talented biotech research analysts, many of whom have either an MD or PhD degree. We continue to believe that scientific expertise is critical uh, to evaluate biotech companies uh, successfully. Uh, in addition to that, Charlie Steinman, my colleague covering life science tools and diagnostics also contributes ideas to the portfolio. And at the very bottom of the slide are actually the four members of our emerging markets team. They are based in Shanghai and Hong Kong, and they help source Chinese biotech ideas for the Biotech Growth Trust. Now let me turn to the investment themes. Why are we so optimistic and excited about the outlook for biotech going forward? So innovation is really the principal driver of value creation in biotech. And we're happy to say that the pipeline uh, for the biopharmaceutical industry continues to get even larger. Uh, so we think we are still uh, in a golden era of innovation for the biopharmaceutical industry. And that is really shown on this slide, which shows the number of late stage pipeline products by therapeutic area from 2010 to 2020. And you'll notice that starting at around 2015, there was a market acceleration and expansion in the number of late stage pipeline products in development. It's increased by about 50% in just the past five years. This has occurred across therapeutic areas. Uh, and I'd highlight one in particular, oncology, which is the light blue band at the very bottom. Oncology therapeutics now represent about 30% of the late stage drug development pipeline and is a particular focus for the biotech industry. 
Now, one of the reasons we've seen this acceleration uh, in drug development over the past five years is because we have a number of new drug development technologies that have really come to fore over the past five years. And along the perimeter of this slide, we've just uh, listed some selected examples of those novel technologies, cell therapy, nucleic acid therapies, multivalent antibodies and cell engagers, therapeutic vaccines, and gene therapy and gene editing companies. And so in each of these boxes, we've shown a representative number uh, or examples of companies working with that particular technology. Now, the central message of the slide, though, is really uh, about uh, the, the center of the slide, which shows the marketed products based upon each of these technologies. And you can see that thus far, we only have a handful of products that have been approved based upon these novel drug development technologies. There are hundreds of clinical candidates that are still working their way through clinical trials based upon these technologies. Uh, and we fully expect dozens more uh, of those drugs uh, to be approved over the next several years. So the central takeaway from this slide is really that we feel like we are still in the very early stages of realizing the full potential from these novel technologies. Now, not only are these novel technologies generating breakthrough therapies uh, for patients that really enhance clinical care, but they also unlock quite significant revenue potential for the sponsors involved. So here is a slide showing a number of recent biotech drug approvals. And within each box, we have shown the estimated peak sales of each of these drugs based upon broker consensus estimates. And every single drug on this slide uh, would be called a blockbuster drug, meaning that they are all capable or anticipated to deliver in excess of $1 billion of sales annually. So um, many of these drugs are based upon the novel technologies that I just outlined. And again, uh, really unlock quite a bit of revenue potential for the companies involved. Uh, you'll notice also that uh, some of these biotech companies actually got acquired after uh, getting their drug approved. So AstraZeneca acquired Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Gilead acquired Immunomedics, Novartis acquired Avexis, which is a gene therapy company. And that is consistent with the normal life cycle of a biotech company that we typically see. Most companies that successfully develop uh, a drug and, and get it on the market are eventually acquired by a larger player. So let me just touch on the regulatory climate. I've noted many times in the past that we have had a very favorable FDA regulatory climate for the approval of new drugs. So former President, uh, former President Trump uh, did support a number of FDA policies to expedite drug approvals as a means of increasing competition to manage drug price inflation. Uh, and so his policies included more frequent and earlier engagement between companies and the agency to streamline development, uh, the FDA commissioners under his administration really advocated and embraced more flexible efficacy and safety standards for FDA approvals. They increased the use of biomarkers and surrogate endpoints. And all of these policies basically lowered the time and cost to develop new drugs, uh, which is obviously a very positive uh, factor for the biotech industry. Now, since uh, President Biden took office, Janet Woodcock has been installed as the acting FDA commissioner, she took office in January. She is a senior FDA official with about 35 years of agency experience. And uh, she would like to become the permanent head uh, of the agency and has clear support from the industry. The other leading candidate for the position is a woman by the name of Michelle McMurray Heath. She is the current president of the Biotrade Organization. This is actually the lobbying organization for the biotech industry. It's unclear when Biden is going to make a formal appointment uh, for the permanent FDA commissioner position, but if indeed these are the two leading candidates, uh, we expect the new head will likely be industry friendly, which will be a positive uh, uh, for, the, for the sector. Now, uh, thus far, so far in 2021, there have been a number of unexpected drug rejections and regulatory delays that have concerned some investors. We do not believe this reflects a new risk averse stance at the FDA. We think they're just contending with a large volume of investigational new drug applications. And there are a number of COVID related inspection delays uh, that have delayed some of those approvals. Uh, overall, in the first quarter of 2021, the number of new drug approvals at the FDA was actually the most we've ever seen in the calendar first quarter. Uh, and additionally, 
the recent approval of aducanumab, which is a drug for Alzheimer's disease based upon a mixed data set, we think also illustrates the continued flexibility of the FDA to approve new drugs for unmet medical needs. So we think the appointment of a permanent FDA commissioner and the end of COVID-related delays should allow constructive FDA policy to continue to benefit the biotech industry. So just uh, uh, in terms of numbers, here is a slide showing the number of new FDA, new molecular entity approvals per year since the year 2000. And you can see that indeed, over the past four years of the Trump administration, we did, we did, we did see a record number of FDA new drug approvals. Hopefully that will continue uh, during the Biden administration. Now turning to M&A, M&A has been a historical driver of performance for the sector. And initially we were a little bit concerned that the COVID pandemic might slow down the M&A activity. But encouragingly, um, despite work from home conditions, M&A and customary business development activities like licensing deals and partnerships have continued unabated throughout the COVID pandemic. Uh, that's shown here uh, in this slide, which shows the number uh, and amount of announced public biotech M&A transactions per quarter since the beginning of 2018. So there's still been quite a bit of healthy activity on the M&A front. Uh, and indeed, at the bottom of this slide, we've shown a number of selected biotech acquisitions that have taken place over the past 12 to 18 months. And the Biotech Growth Trust actually benefited directly from three of these transactions. So we held Alexion Pharmaceuticals in the portfolio that was acquired uh, by AstraZeneca recently. We held shares in Pandion Therapeutics, which was acquired by Merck. And we also held shares in Immunomedics, uh, which was acquired by Gilead Sciences. Uh, in addition, if you look at the financing environment, we have had a very uh, constructive financing environment for biotech. So investors have, um, uh, been excited about deploying capital in this sector. And that's revealed in this graph here, which shows the number of biotech IPOs per quarter since the beginning of 2011. And you can see that just in the past 12 to 18 months, we have seen quite a surge of biotech IPO activity in terms of number of deals, as well as funds raised for the biotech sector. And that of course is a, a, a healthy uh, a sign that the biotech sector it remains very popular uh, among investors. Now, since the beginning of 2018, over 200 new biotech companies have gone public. We estimate that that brings the investable universe in biotech worldwide to over 1500 companies. So there's quite a large universe uh, from which we can choose to populate our portfolio. And the Biotech Growth Trust has been actively participating in many of these IPOs, as well as selected crossover transactions. So the crossover deal is basically the last private round prior to an IPO. We've been very, very active in that space because we can get into some of these companies at a very compelling valuation at that stage. Now, the reason we've been so active uh, on the IPO front is because many of the companies going public are the ones with the most cutting edge technologies in biotech. And we wanna make sure that we have exposure in the portfolio to the most novel biotechnologies. Uh, moving next to uh, opportunities in China. So this is again, something that I've highlighted in the past. China is the second largest pharmaceutical market in the world, and we are seeing growing innovation uh, in that particular country. So if you look at the upper right-hand corner of the slide, we have some data from IQVIA, a data provider, that shows the number of early stage pipeline drugs by company location over time, and the share of that early stage pipeline for the industry by country. And you can see that China here is highlighted in orange, and as of 2020, IQVIA actually estimates that 12% of the early stage pipeline for the entire industry is actually now being developed in China. That is a remarkable increase from just five years ago when uh, most of the uh, uh, drugs, um, or most of the drugs that were being developed worldwide, very few of them were being sourced out of China. Uh, and the reason for that is because starting in 2015, the Chinese government actually committed to building a biotech ecosystem in China formally as part of their 10 year made in China 2025 plan. Subsequent to that, the Chinese FDA undertook a number of reforms, including introducing initiatives to expedite approval of innovative drugs, as well as significantly shortening drug review times. In addition to that, uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the A-Share Star Board loosened their listing requirements for IPOs and now basically allow pre-revenue biotech companies to go public 
that has opened up uh, uh, an important financing uh, 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 route for these companies. Uh, and then lastly, multinational companies over the past three to five years are now increasingly focusing on China as an important growth market for their products and indeed have begun in licensing innovative assets from Chinese biotech companies validating their technologies. And we have listed here at the bottom of the slide a number of examples of licensing deals between Western biopharmaceutical companies and Chinese biotech companies. This would have been unheard of about 10 years ago, but really uh, goes to show how much innovation has come of age in China recently. Now we think at Orbiman, we are perfectly well positioned to take advantage of this uh, new burgeoning opportunity. We do have a local research team, as I mentioned earlier, in Shanghai and Hong Kong. And so we think we're well poised to really take advantage of the investment opportunities in China going forward. Lastly, just a point on COVID-19. Uh, so from the very beginning of the pandemic, it's always been our view that several effective vaccines and treatments would be developed for COVID-19. And that's exactly what we've seen come to pass. Now over 50% of the adult US population has been fully vaccinated against COVID. The vaccination rollouts outside of the United States have been a bit more mixed, and that, of course, has led to some new variants to emerge, including the Delta variant that's uh, in the news these days. But fortunately, the vaccine manufacturers are already developing second generation vaccines against these variants, including multivalent ones that can be used as boosters. And we fully expect uh, that the multiple highly effective vaccines will ultimately get approved worldwide and really bring this pandemic to an end. Thus far, the impact on biotech from COVID-19 has been manageable. Uh, sales have largely been sustained, though the growth has been incrementally dampened. We think the promotion-sensitive drugs have really seen the most impact from the COVID-related lockdowns because their sales forces uh, for a time could no longer promote those drugs in person at doctor's offices. But as reopening uh, unfolds, we think uh, those promotion-sensitive drugs should see an uptake, uh, uptick in sales. New clinical trial initiations were temporarily delayed due to COVID. Many of the trials that were put on pause have now resumed enrollment, so that's great news. They're now back on track. And I would also note that while COVID certainly attracted a lot of new investor interest to the biotech sector, the bulk of the innovation occurring in biotech is actually outside of COVID. And that's where we think most of the long-term value creation uh, is going to occur. Uh, now, one consequence of all of the biopharmaceutical industries work on COVID is the political benefit I think that they're getting uh, for their work on vaccines. If one looks at some of the recent polls uh, of the public and their view on the industry, the view on the industry has certainly improved uh, over the course of the COVID pandemic. I think the industry has really shown uh, their value to society and how they can really become uh, a, a deciding factor uh, in public health crises such as COVID. Lastly, uh, people talk about the reopening trade, uh, and that unfortunately has hit biotech growth, track perf growth stock performance since mid-February. We think this impact is likely going to be transient, but essentially rising U.S. Treasury yields and vaccination progress have really led to a growth to value rotation as investors pivot to sectors more sensitive to an economic recovery. That again has hurt biotech growth, trucks, growth stocks temporarily, especially small cap names. But over the long term, we still think biotech sector performance still hinges primarily on innovation, and that remains very strong. So we think biotech should continue to perform as COVID is brought under control and should outperform actually in the unlikely event that COVID resurges just as it outperformed in 2020. So with that, let me now turn to the biotech growth trust specifically. Focusing first on the performance of the trust over the last fiscal year ending March 31st, 2021. You can see that we had a very strong year of performance. The biotech growth trust NAV was up 55% over this time period. We beat the benchmark index, the NASDAQ biotech index, which was only up 25% over these 12 months. And the share price actually was up 75% uh, over this time because the discount narrowed uh, over the fiscal year. Moving on to the biggest uh, contributors and detractors to performance, uh, here are the top five contributors and detractors. I would encourage you to look at the annual report for more specific information about these individual names. But overall, I would say that fiscal 2021 results were extremely strong on both an absolute and relative basis. 
And the fund really benefited from a number of factors. Number one, we had a number of positive clinical trial developments in the portfolio. CRISPR Therapeutics, which is a gene editing company, uh, announced some strong phase one, two results for their gene editing program in beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. Curis, uh, an under the radar screen oncology name, announced some encouraging phase one results for their IRAC1 inhibitor in acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, we benefited, of course, from a number of MA transactions, which I mentioned uh, earlier. And then we also had very strong performance from our crossover positions and IPO investments. So Kiris Therapeutics was a crossover position uh, that we had that subsequently went public. It's done very well since then. They're focused on therapeutics for hematological and musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, there are a couple of Chinese crossover deals that we did. Burning Rock, a leading liquid biopsy company, as well as Yisheng Biopharma, this is a Chinese biotech developing vaccines and immunotherapies for cancer. Uh, and even uh, we had a Korean, uh, Korean biotech company that we participated in the IPO for, SK Biopharmaceuticals. They are launching an anti-epilepsy drug in the United States. Uh, we think that drug has a particularly strong profile and uh, that IPO has done very well as well. So turning on to the next page, uh, here is just a table showing the Biotech Growth Trust performance versus our benchmark index, the Nasdaq Biotech Index, over various time periods. And you can see that um, over most of these time periods, whether it's three years, five years, 10 years, or since inception, we have succeeded in generating excess performance versus our benchmark index, the Nasdaq Biotech Index. Um, with one exception, of course, which is the current fiscal year, we are lagging uh, a bit behind the index. That is because there's much more small cap biotech exposure in the fund relative to the NASDAQ biotech index and small caps have underperformed large cap biotech over the past three months. We think that's a transient phenomenon. We think that's largely played out and we're confident that we can restore our performance for the balance of the current fiscal year. So here on the next page is a snapshot of the biotech growth trust holdings as of June 30th of this year. Uh, there has been a gradual creep up in name count in the portfolio. That's because we have been so active in participating in IPOs and crossover deals. But uh, about 85% of this portfolio, you can see, is actually based in the United States. We have about 9% of exposure in Europe and 17% uh, uh, in China. Uh, and the bulk of the innovation still is occurring in the United States, which is why uh, geographically, the portfolio is still slanted overwhelmingly uh, in the United States. Um, I would also note that a number of the positions on this slide denoted with an asterisk are crossover positions that are still private. We expect those positions to go public within the next six to 12 months. And as of June 30th, uh, a little less than 5% of the NAV of the portfolio was invested in these crossover names. So just to wrap up, uh, what is our 2021 strategy and outlook? Well, we continue to, uh, uh, we hope to continue the strong performance of the fund on both an absolute and relative basis with essentially the same strategy that we employed in 2020. So the portfolio will continue to emphasize emerging biotech over large cap biotech. We're going to continue our strategy of investing in select crossover and emerging markets opportunities. The gearing level, you should expect to stay generally between 5 and 10%. We think COVID-19 and the pandemic should gradually abate. Vaccine rollouts will continue. Economies will reopen. And we're really confident that additional effective vaccines and treatments will get approved, with the second-generation vaccines really dealing effectively with the new variants. But even if we're wrong, again, with COVID and, and the outlook there and COVID happens to resurge, we do think biotech as a sector should fare better than other sectors of the economy uh, if that occurs. Innovation remains strong in this sector. We are still in the early stages in our view of these transformative technologies reaching their full potential. The regulatory environment we expect to remain constructive, M&A should continue. And lastly, we think the political environment has actually improved quite dramatically since President Biden's election in November, despite the fact that the Democrats now nominally do control both houses of Congress. The majorities that they have in both the House and Senate are so razor thin that we think uh, that really makes passage of transformative adverse drug pricing legislation extremely unlikely. So we think a lot of the political overhang on the sector has also abated quite a bit. So overall, um, we remain very, very bullish on the outlook for biotech 
and we are looking forward to continued strong performance for the fund for the balance of this year. With that, uh, thank you again for your time, and I'm happy now to take questions. Jeff, thank you very much indeed. Um, Alistair Smith uh, of Frostro is going to uh, moderate the questions, of which we've uh, had a small number on the Q&A. Hello. Hello, yes, everyone. My name is Alistair Smith. Uh, and thank you very much indeed, Jeff, for that very interesting presentation. Um, we do have three questions that come in, and in fact, there was one submitted in advance by Mr. Terence Prido. Um, I think you've touched on the FDA, but I'll put this to you, this question to you anyway. Um, he says, please can you advise on how the FDA is handling its regulatory role in the light of extra resources given to COVID-19? Do you regard the agency to be minded to continue the Gottlieb approach, or do you expect a more restrained style? Sure, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so as I mentioned in the presentation, we do expect the FDA regulatory stance to remain constructive for the industry. So we are not expecting any appreciable change from you know, what they call the Gottlieb approach uh, uh, going forward. Um, I do think that uh, the FDA will need to increase its budget in order to hire enough reviewers to uh, evaluate all of the new applications that they're getting. Uh, and of course, COVID as it subsides uh, should uh, obviously free up some uh, capacity at the agency as well. I know the FDA has asked for an 8% increase in its budget for the coming fiscal year. I believe President Biden supports that increase. Uh, and I think we'll also get um, uh, with some robust leadership with the appointment of a permanent FDA commissioner um, uh, that should keep things on track in terms of uh, approval rates for the agency. Thank you, Jeff. We've got uh, Mr. Stephen McKenna submitted a question. Um, what is the absolute amount, what is, what is the absolute most amount you'd want to see invested in the unquoted and emerging market companies? And would this mean the board changing your powers to invest in unquoted and gearing headroom? So a number of factors there, but um, a question about the exposure to unquoted and emerging markets and how that might affect the gearing, perhaps. Sure. So we think the crossover space provides actually some of the best risk reward in terms of investment return uh, right now in the biotech universe. So we've been very, very active there. Uh, the fund is capped at 10% of gross assets being invested in those unquoted uh, uh, investments. Um, but we will continue to evaluate the landscape and really uh, take a bottoms up approach to the extent that we find compelling crossover investments, we'll, we'll put them in the portfolio at the appropriate uh, target weights, but only up to 10% of, of the fund. Uh, with regards to emerging markets, we don't have a formal limit on how much we could invest in emerging markets. You saw on the slide earlier that about 12% of the early stage pipeline is now accounted for by China. Um, right now, it's the weighting is between 15 and 20%. I think you should probably expect that weighting to be remain in that range uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and then in terms of gearing, um, formally speaking, we are limited to 12, 20%, uh, excuse me, 20% gearing uh, in, the, in, in the trust. Um, but uh, up to now, we've sort of kept ourselves in this five to 10% uh, range uh, with regards to gearing. Um, that's the level of gearing that we're comfortable with, given the inherent volatility of the sector. Um, but uh, that's our plans going forward for that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Mr. Henry Bamford has submitted two. I'll go the first. Um, the first one is, why has the, uh, why has the European early stage pipeline fallen so sharply? So I, th I suspect, and if you look at that slide, if you look at the dark blue band corresponding to European uh, uh, pipeline candidates, I think it's actually remained fairly constant. And I think it's the, the loss in market share is really due to the fact that countries like China uh, are just introducing many more new, uh, uh, new compounds into the, into the global pipeline. And so I think it's just a, uh, uh, an aspect of, of Europe, in fact, being diluted down in terms of their market share rather than necessarily that the absolute number of candidates in Europe is going down. Okay, uh, we'll go to one from Tanya Yankova now. Um, what is your view on number one, the likelihood, and two, the impact of policy changes in the US from drug 
from a drug pricing perspective, but also in terms of potential corporate tax increases or hikes. So, so as I mentioned, um, we think the Democratic majorities in both the House and Senate are, are so slim. Um, the Democrats basically can't lose more than three or four seats in the House to pass anything along uh, party lines. Um, in the Senate, uh, the number of Democratic senators and Republicans is exactly, is exactly equal at 50 apiece. Uh, so Kamala Harris, the vice president, would be uh, the tiebreaker on any vote there. And so I think those majorities are so slim that any sort of super progressive drug pricing legislation is basically impossible to pass. Now, having said that, I do expect some incremental legislation will likely be passed, um, something that will cap out-of-pocket costs, for example, for consumers, um, maybe some curbs on how much drug companies can increase their prices on a yearly basis. But all of those incremental policies are, are frankly quite manageable for the industry and will not have a significant detrimental uh, impact. I think the industry actually welcomes uh, legislation getting passed in some form with regards to drug pricing because they're tired of having this uh, as an overhang for the sector. They just want Congress to pass something um, that is consumer friendly. Uh, and then hopefully uh, Congress would then uh, focus its, its attention and time on other priorities. Um, in regards to corporate tax hikes, uh, that's certainly something that President Biden would like to uh, pass. Um, the latest I've heard, though, is that he's kind of backed away from that. Um, he may not get the, uh, the support he needs, again, because the Democrats have such a slim majority in Congress to be able to pass a lot of those, those corporate tax hikes. Clearly, corporate tax, hike, uh, uh, corporate tax hikes across the board in the United States would be detrimental for the entire stock market, not just uh, anything particular to biotech. A lot of the larger biotech companies, though, have quite a diversified tax base because they do sell their products in multiple countries, not just in the United States. And so that will tend to dilute any impact from uh, an increase in just U.S. tax rates. Thank you, Jeff. The, the second one from Henry Bamforth is, what are the prospects for President Biden achieving some drug regulation through FDA reform and appointments? Could the FDA be wound up by an executive order and replaced with a regulatory focused body? Uh, I don't believe the FDA could be wound up by an executive order and replaced by a regulatory focused body. Um, mm -hmm. There are certain tools that the president can use called executive orders um, that on the margin uh, can have an impact on, on drug prices, but really um, they're really confined to what are called demonstration projects. So the president can call for um, uh, some sort of uh, pilot study, if you will, of, of a particular drug pricing paradigm, um, but that will not affect the entire country. Anything really that is going to significantly, significantly affect the industry really has to pass uh, Congress and, and become legislation. So I think the president is quite limited in its uh, uh, drug pricing powers, if you will. President Trump, during his administration, he also wanted to reduce drug prices he uh, announced a number of executive orders and they basically had uh, zero effect on, on the industry. So we're not concerned about uh, that at all. Thank you, Jeff. Um, one or two questions from Krishna uh, Mehendale, asking about the people employed at Orbin Med. Has anyone left? Has anyone joined? Um, and also, I think you've asked how many, if, if any of them are on the online. I mean, I can confirm that the, all the board of directors are online. You just can't see them on the screen because their videos are turned off. But perhaps you could comment on, um, I think you've already touched on Orbimed um, developments in personnel, but perhaps if you just wish to add a little to that and also a question about, um, about uh, um, competing um, about about your competitors or indeed competing investment trusts, of which, of course, there aren't many. So, uh, you know, we continue to expand our team, actually. Um, as I noted on the slide with regards to the IPO activity in biotech, we are seeing more and more biotech companies go public. So the investable universe uh, is constantly increasing. And we've seen uh, uh, it appropriate to expand our team commensurately to um, 
devote enough research firepower, if you will, to cover that expanded universe of companies. So if anything, our, our team continues to expand. Um, there will be sort of normal turnover as with any large organization. Um, people uh, might leave the organization for, for various reasons, but um, uh, we think there's a, quite a talented pool out there that we can hire from. And we actually hire many individuals from fresh out of PhD programs in the sciences. Um, and there are quite a number of, 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 uh, of candidates there that we can choose from as well. So um, we will continue to uh, expand and uh, uh, groom our talent pool internally uh, to meet the uh, uh, investment uh, uh, universe that we see uh, out there in biotech. Thank you. Then we've got two questions from an anonymous attendee. Do you own any shares in the trust? I think there are if you could comment on that. And also, how, how are pre-revenue companies valued? So I, I do not own any shares in the trust right now. That's primarily for tax reasons. Um, there are some complicated tax implications if I own uh, shares in a UK-based trust. I can tell you, though, that my compensation is very much uh, dependent upon uh, how this trust performs. So um, I'm, I'm heavily incentivized to to make sure that this, this trust outperforms the index. Um, with regards to how we value companies that are pre-revenue, so we actually construct models on each of our, our, our companies and we'll project out uh, the income statement for those companies out to when they do get revenue and then we can calculate a projected future earnings per share and then we can discount that back to today. Um, and that's how we come up with an approximate uh, evaluation for the company. Uh, uh, at the current time. So um, that actually works uh, fairly well. Uh, obviously, it's going to be very dependent upon what projections one, one, one presumes and uh, most, uh, mostly depends actually on the probability of success that we assign to the particular asset driving those, uh, the, driving those future revenues. And uh, that's really going to be the dominant factor in, in driving a lot of the valuation. I would also highlight that it's not, it's not all been made that sort of that solely come up with the valuations. There is a, a process through um, Frostro as the um, authorized investment fund manager. And of course, the board of directors um, adopt the um, valuations um, within the company's own books and records. So there is a, a robust uh, governance process around the valuation of unquoted investments. Now, we need to move on, I think, to the formal business of the meeting. I can't see any other questions that have come through. Perhaps we could, Andrew, perhaps uh, Chairman, perhaps we could go to the formal business. And yeah. then if there are any other questions, we could take those after that. Absolutely. No, thank you very much. So, um, Alistair, and thank you again to Jeff. Um, I think uh, it's always probably the most interesting part of our meeting, um, but uh, actually we're, we're also here to conduct the formal annual general meeting of the, of the, uh, of the fund. Um, and if you do have further questions, as Alistair mentioned, uh, carry on using the same Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I'm... Uh, Pleased to confirm that this meeting is quarried and we can now proceed to business. You should all have received the notice convening this meeting dated 4th of June, 2021, uh, included on pages 92 to 94 of the annual report. And with your permission, uh, I shall take that notice as read. Thank you. I'd like to point out that voting for each of the resolutions at this meeting will be conducted by a poll this is due to the unusual manner in which we're conducting today's meeting, i.e. virtually, and gives all the shareholders the opportunity to participate in the decision-making of the company and have their votes recorded. The directors have voted by proxy in advance of the meeting. Before we get on to the resolutions, uh, I just wanted uh, to pause and uh, mention, as you know, that Professor Dame K. Davis is retiring at the conclusion of this annual meeting. Kay has been a director since 2012. Her extensive scientific knowledge, experience and wise counsel will be great, greatly missed. She wears her learning lightly, but my goodness, um, she's, to be quite honest, of the directors 
the one who really, really understands the deep science and um, her contribution has been immense. Uh, and she's been uh, a, a, a great colleague to have. Um, and uh, as I say, we'll, she'll be sorely missed. On behalf of the board, I'd like to thank her for all her hard work during her time as a director. I'd also like to take this opportunity uh, to thank both uh, Jeff and Orbimed and um, Alistair, Mark and their colleagues at Frostro. The last year has been uh, an, an enormous challenge, uh, as we all know, um, and uh, neither Orbimed nor Frostro have missed a beat. Uh, and um, I think the board of directors have been extremely impressed uh, not only by the substance of what they've done, but also how they've gone about it in uh, these challenging uh, circumstances. There are 14 resolutions today um, that are going to be proposed to the meeting. Um, many shareholders have already sent in proxies and obviously I'll vote in accordance with how, how I've been instructed, uh, proxies appointing me and I'll vote as, as instructed. Um, if they have given me discretion as to how to vote, I'll vote in favour of the resolutions concerned on their behalf. I now formally put to the meeting each of the resolutions set out in the notice dated 4th of June 2021. Resolution 1 is an ordinary resolution and proposes that the company's audited financial statements and the report of the directors at the year end of 31st March 2021 be received and accepted. Resolution 2 is an ordinary resolution and proposes the approval of the Director's Remuneration Report for the year ended 31st March 2021. Resolution 3 is an ordinary resolution and proposes to re-elect myself, Andrew Joy, as a Director. Resolution 4 is an ordinary resolution and proposes to elect Dr Nikki Shepherd as a Director. Um, that's for the first time. Resolution 5 is an ordinary resolution and proposes to re-elect Steve Bates as a director. Resolution 6 is an ordinary resolution and proposes to re-elect Right Honourable Lord Willits as a director. Resolution 7 is an ordinary resolution and proposes to re-elect Julia Leblanc as a director. Resolution 8 is an ordinary resolution and proposes to re-elect Jeff Shu as a director. Resolution 9 is an ordinary resolution and proposes the reappointment of BDO LLP as auditor to the company and to authorise the audit committee to determine their re remuneration. Resolution 10 is an ordinary resolution to allow the directors to issue new shares in the company subject to the provisions set out in the resolution. Resolution 11 is a special resolution to disapply preemption rights in respect of new shares in the company that the directors may issue pursuant to the previous resolution, subject to the provisions set out in the resolution. Resolution 12 is a special resolution to authorise the company to make market purchases of the company's ordinary shares, subject to the provisions in the resolution. Resolution 13 is a special resolution that any general meeting of the company, other than the annual general meeting of the company, shall be called by with at least 14 clear days notice provided that the authority shall expire on the conclusion of the next annual general meeting of the company, or if earlier, on the expiry of 15 months from the date of passing this resolution. Resolution 14 is a special resolution and proposes the adoption of new articles of association, which have been produced to the meeting and signed by me in substitution for and to the exclusion of the existing articles of association. I commend all of the above the resolutions to the meeting and I'm pleased to confirm that the proxies that I hold, including, including those that give me discretion on voting, are all at least 90% in favour of each of the resolutions. The results of the poll will be announced to the Stock, London Stock Exchange by close of business today and will also be published on the company's website. I'd now like to deal with any questions relating to this AGM. As mentioned previously, uh, if you have a question, please do click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and again, it would be helpful if you're representing an organization, uh, if you could say uh, uh, which that is, or alternatively, if you are a private shareholder. And again, um, 
Alistair Smith of Frostro uh, will act as the moderator of um, such Q&A uh, as there is. I can report that there are no additional questions. Perhaps we might just pause for a few seconds just to give anyone that wishes a chance. So if we just pause for a few seconds. Well, that, that was about 15 seconds. <laughs> Andrew, uh, Chairman, the, there are no questions have come through, so... Um... Good. Well, thank you, Alistair, um, and thank you, all en attendees. Um, I'm sorry we can't adjourn for a sandwich. Uh, virtual sandwiches have yet to be invented. Um, but uh, thank you for attending anyway. Um, that concludes the formal business, and I declare the meeting closed. <laughs>